Okay, great. So, um, Rethink Red Deer is the proud host of the workshop today and really uh, excited to work with Birch Permaculture as we have over the last couple of years for our uh, uh, Piper Creek project, specifically the uh, reframing the watershed initiative. And out at the Piper Creek Community Garden site, we've been working with numerous um, nonprofit partners, including the City of Red Deer and other municipalities, to demonstrate uh, urban sustainability in terms of how we can bring together annual growing with perennial growing and sustainable architecture to demonstrate to the community what they can take back home and hopefully apply where they live. Because as we like to say, sustainability starts at your back door. And the, uh, I guess you could call it the culmination of this project in terms of what we have funding for is this workshop with you all today, which kind of leads us into the 2022 growing season and the national year of the garden. So it's very timely for us. And we, uh, before the pandemic, were successful in completing the construction of a timber frame barn at that Piper Creek site. And we're utilizing that as the quote unquote watershed. And so it's a play on words there, uh, using the structure as a microcosm, I guess you could say, of the grander uh, watershed that we all live and play in and work as well. And uh, the plan is to both actively and passively harvest rainwater off that structure and to demonstrate again for people, uh, both in homes and in businesses, how they can take those practices and apply them to their structures. So our um, uh, great hosts today and presenters, uh, Dr. Peter Coombs and Michelle Avis are going to wow us with their knowledge and expertise <laughs> and the work they've done over the last couple of years to put together a really uh, in-depth course through Verge Permaculture, but uh, also of course, Peter's uh, um, career work in the field of, of water, uh, specifically rainwater harvesting. And so we're uh, again, grateful for the funding we've received from the province of Alberta through environment and parks, uh, specifically the Watershed Restoration and Resiliency Program grant. We've now received it twice. And so that's what enabled us to put this workshop together in addition to a number of uh, physical installations at the project site for riparian plantings, uh, rain gardens, eco buffers, those types of things we're trying to demonstrate and show people what uh, helps us integrate our urban lifestyle into the natural world. So with, uh, without more droning on, I think I've covered all my main points. I'll pass things over now to uh, Dr. Peter Coombs and Michelle Avis to get us underway. Uh, they have a presentation to start and then we'll have Q&A afterwards. So let's uh, take advantage of every minute there. Maybe do introductions as well too, if you want to uh, kick that off maybe for us, Michelle and Peter. Oh, that's the wrong one. You guys can see my speaker notes. Okay, mm -hmm. let's see if I can get this right. Um, ah, this one. Hey, do you guys see a nice slide? Rainwater harvesting. Why should we? But we also see all the tabs that you have open. Yeah, well, that's just that's just all the tabs I have. Okay. Open. <laughs> <laughs> uh, welcome and thanks so much, everyone, for coming today. This is a topic that uh, Peter and I are both really passionate about and pretty excited to be sharing what we know. Um, as Renee said, my name is Michelle. And my husband and I run Verge Permaculture. We're both engineers, and um, we actually live just about an hour, an hour and fifteen minutes north uh, west of Edmonton, on the west end of Battle Lake, where we are currently developing our own little kind of permaculture property with, um, you know, um, with uh, landscape water harvesting and rooftop rainwater harvesting and um, just all things sustainability. We're really interested in both um, all these topics and in demonstrating them on our farm. So a few years ago, I got asked by New Society Publishers if I would be interested, or Rob and I got asked, I should say, if we would be interested in writing a book on rainwater harvesting as part of a series of uh, technical books that they have, the Essential Building, or the Sustainable Building Essentials series. And we thought, hmm, we'd, we'd been kind of doing rainwater. We had an engineering background. Didn't see that there was a lot of great content out there on it. And um, somewhat naively decided, yeah, I can do this. I can, we could figure this out and write a book. And through the research, when I really started to diving, diving into uh, this, the idea of capturing rain from the sky and actually using it both outdoors and indoors, 
I stumbled across some research that came out of um, Peter's group out in Australia. And I reached out to him at one point and said, hey, would you mind proofreading? Would you give me a technical review of the book? And the rest is almost history. I mean, that was four years ago. Peter reviewed the book for us and had a lot of um, great input for me and set me on, um, you know, clarified a lot of myths that, um, that I had previously thought to be true. And we, um, I really enjoyed working with him. So then we struck out on a collaboration to educate, do more education and to do more teaching about rainwater harvesting. So we've actually been teaching online courses on rainwater harvesting for, is this our third year? We'll be heading into our fourth year now. So that's a little bit of background and context to myself and the collaboration with Peter. But I would like you, Peter, to introduce yourself as well. So passing it on. Hello, everyone. Thanks, Michelle. Um, my name is Peter Coombs. Um, I live in a house that's operated primarily off rainwater and solar energy for over 20 years. Um, and it's been quite a journey. Um, so rainwater supplies all the house. It's, it's backed up by the grid. Um, sun supplies all the energy by, uh, with solar batteries and backed up by the grid. So um, it's been a nice journey in Australia, but I'm a professor at Australian National University um, in the Crawford School of Public Policy. Um, I'm also an engineer, a surveyor and economist, and I also did some um, microbiology in my training, uh, which makes sense given I'm a system scientist, so I work on how everything fits together. Um, and I guess my journey, research journey in life and my policy journey, because I've been a government advisor and a, a government chief scientist in this country, is, is that small things actually make a, a very large difference. Um, it doesn't matter if you're an engineer or an economist. Um, and the classic story I tell people about how we were working with our national treasury and they, um, I was asked to review something when well, they were doing carbon pricing. And I remember going to the meeting and saying, well, I think you've missed something because you're only counting the, the uh, business and the energy generators. I think your biggest opportunity was the households. Um, and our head of treasury said, well, our macroeconomic models actually don't go down to that level. Um, we probably don't need to. And they acknowledged that Behaviour starts with people and houses and properties and, and what happened in our country whilst we had some common sense is we had significant changes in our carbon emissions that were actually delivered by households um, at the property scale, which in, weren't in the calculation. So you know, something small doesn't make a difference. Well, maybe that's not true. Um, I currently do a lot of work now at my stage of career as a reviewer for government um, in our courts and also in government policy. Um, I met Michelle with a phone call. Would I like to spend a couple of hours reviewing a book, you know, rather than watching silly stuff on nighttime TV? And we, uh, four or five years ago now, and the journey has gone on since. Um, it's been terrific fun. Um, Michelle actually chose a book topic area where um, there are more myths and hearsay than there are actually facts. Um, and uh, so it was a good thing to choose, I think, Michelle, if you want to kick off. <laughs> All right. Well, then let's tell them what we're going to tell them about here today. Peter and I are going to start off telling you guys a little bit about the opportunity that we see. Um, and it really ties to this idea of how everything is connected in systems thinking. And Peter dropped some hints about his area of expertise, which is understanding systems and system dynamics. Um, that's also like, you know, cumulative effects and whole system impacts. So, if, you know, if that doesn't make sense right now, it will shortly. We're going we're gonna to talk a little bit about um, high level, what we call anatomy of a rainwater harvesting system or, you know, the rainwater harvesting treatment train. I didn't put it in here. We're going to play a fun little game 
fun little game with you guys towards the end. Some myths. We're going to try and bust some, bust some myths, do a little true or false, see how well you guys do. And uh, we will leave time for questions, Q&A at the end. So with that, let's start here. Peter, what is the opportunity? So this comes to uh, the idea it's a, that uh, small things don't make any difference, so why bother? But um, this slide also come, comes from my days as a policy advisor where, where um, the people in cities, uh, government and the governance of cities are saying, well, our cities are set in stone. You can't change to sustainability. You can't um, do any better. Um, the buildings are here for a hundred years, therefore there's no change involved. So let's, no change possible, but let's think about this. And I've used the red deer example. Um, just say your population is, is about 108,000 and you've got a, almost a 0.9% per annum growth rate. Um, the searching around that was very interesting. There are all sorts of numbers, so apologies if that's not the right one. So if you include all new dwellings and buildings in water planning, uh, sustainable water planning, by 2050, that'd be 21% of buildings and dwellings. So let me understand this. Let, let me explain this. You're, you're just using the power of the planning system because every year something changes in the planning system. There's, there's new developments and um, and they are approved and they could be sustainable or they can be business as usual. So if you choose the sustainable route, and we had this in the basics policy in Australia, which I was one of the people who convinced our national uh, state cabinet to, to create, you use the power of the planning system. Every time you approve a new, a new project, you make it sustainable. And before you know it, over time, you your building stock um, changes to a sustainable building stock rather than not. And it's a very uh, economically affordable way to do it. However, every city also has urban renewal. So I don't know what that number is for um, Red Deer, say it's 25.25% per annum. So that's buildings that don't get pulled down, but they get restored or renovated and uh, upgraded so if you include these renovated, and sometimes buildings are replaced, so there's not a, a new property, uh, it's just the building on the property is completely replaced with other dwellings. So, you know, uh, a single house on a large property becomes a, a block of units, for example. And if those renovated or replacement dwellings and buildings are in water planning, even at 0.25% per annum, that's nearly 6% of these um, uh, buildings are, could be sustainable by 2050. So in doing that, your decent, decentralized strategies can add capacity to aging water, sewage and stormwater infrastructure networks because you're actually taking the, um, taking the pressure off those networks. So if you're a town planner, um, one of the mantras of the modern era was we can solve our sustainability problems by, by getting urban density, so densifying your urban areas. What hasn't been considered in that is all of the infrastructure that supports your cities has to take um, uh, fairly, far more intense demands and, and, and discharges. Um, and so you have to take the pressure off that. It's only possible if the buildings are actually sustainable and change their use and, and discharges. So you can do that. So in total impact to 2050 without other projects, could be 27% of dwellings and buildings that, that have sustainable solutions. So you're dramatically changing your building stock. So you can reduce demand for water and impacts on waterways and ecosystem services and requirement for centralized infrastructure by simply changing the way your planning system works and requiring sustainable buildings. Yeah, I found Peter, the first time we went through these numbers, 
because we recently gave a similar talk at another natural building conference um, when we ran the numbers for Vancouver, you know, I, I find this so, um, it's good news. It's exciting because we, we do tend to get intimidated by the problem, this massive problem of all this, you know, completely unsustainable, poorly built buildings and feel like it's unsurmountable in terms of shifting, making the shift. And, um, you know, the math actually shows all you need to do is, is, is some policy change for all new development permits. And in 30 years, which isn't really that long, I'm getting to the point where in, in, in my time, my lifetime, I'm thinking 30 years is not very long. <laughs> you know, you could have 30% of buildings in the city have these sustainable sustainability features. And that's without really big incentives as well, right? That's really small, possibly what could be considered small policy change. Wouldn't you say, Peter? Uh, yes, indeed. And in fact, the, uh, the a living example of this is the basics policy in Australia that was created in New South Wales, Australia, which was created in 2004, um, has a very strong net benefit uh, to society. It's also basics is water and energy and green infrastructure. So you're trying to keep um, buildings below, 40% below a business as usual water and energy demand. So it's a very simple, uh, target as well. The um, yes, yeah, so the bit of politics from time to time. The uh, infrastructure builders around the water utilities want basics to go because there's a incorrect belief. If you increase demand for water, you sell more water, you can buy more infrastructure. So there's some pr profound um, policy discussions that go on at the top level. Um, but ultimately, uh, which is my research as well, um, water, water utilities that have demand reduced for them because operating costs are far higher than uh, most people believe because we usually focus on capital costs, the operating costs go down, the need to augment infrastructure goes down and the um, utility, the city and the households are better off. So. Yeah, and we're gonna we're gonna provide some more examples of that, a little bit more tangible, right? Okay, so let and then Absolutely. with that, let's let's see what we have next. Okay, so now specific to Red Deer, Peter and I pulled together a few pictures, and I think uh, Renee provided us with some information, and maybe I don't know, there was a contact at the city of Red Deer as well. So thank you. Um, and but this is pretty high level, so admittedly. You know, in our in our 15 minutes of research, um, this is what we came to. That it looks like the city of Red Deer has a water supply, pulling water out of the uh, Red Deer River, right? And there's 50 kilometers of transfer. Um, I think that's what this picture is on the left, where water drinking water is sent all the way up to Panoka. Right, and there's 2.8 million meters cubed of water in that supply system. And then the, you probably might have to correct me if I'm wrong, and this could be part of this discussion that's kind of interesting. I'm not sure if the water is sent south as well, but I know that the wastewater system, so now the water coming back to the city of Red Deer, going to the waste treatment facility, the numbers we have was about closer to 90 kilometers of transfer with four major lift stations. And the operating costs of this, this big centralized system of both water distribution and water, um, uh, what would be the opposite of, I guess it's still distribution, but bringing it back to a wastewater treatment site. Uh, the numbers we were able to find for 2020, there was an operated, operation cost for treatment of 6.4 million, transfer was 2.7 million, so total of $9.1 million in the Red Deer budget. And then there was an additional that we pulled out a few line items that we could find out of the 2021 2022 capital budget. And it looked like there was another $45 million in capital projects related to these, these two water utility systems, water distribution and wastewater. What do you want to add to that, Peter, about these points? Yeah, so the, um, it's important to frame these discussions by by looking at these realities, um, 
when we have centralized systems, which are necessary as underpinning uh, our um, supply, there's always capital operating costs and um, and often the, the the water charges don't give a complete view of how much they are and uh, the extent of infrastructure that's being supplied. Um, the important issue here is what is being moved a long way um, and what has been disposed of over an even longer distance. So that those transfers of water. So if you're changing the volume of water, you're transferring less water and demanding less water flow through the infrastructure. That's why um, saving water at the building scale um, and reducing stormwater runoff at the building scale become, at the property scale becomes very important. Yeah, let's 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 go in further and talk about how, you know, with that context, this is your research, so some of your research, and this comes directly from some papers that you've published. Again, so this is, thinking about the connectivity. Yeah. So this is um, this important issue of infrastructure connectivity. Um, it's my economic research with a with Treasury for a, little, a long time ago, and uh, it's now in our national policy. Um, so these things take a long time. So let's take the river. Um, it's passing the city and the city extracts water from the, the weir. Um, the city might also have a desalination plant for water supply and some other source, but you're extracting- Not, not in Red Deer. <laughs> not in Red Deer, so- um, Okay, so skip that. There's no desal plant. In, in the dam, <laughs> um, which is at point A. Um, but all through your distribution system, there are pumps, the small pumps and big pumps. You know, normally we talk about the big pumps, but there's lots of small pumps as well to make it work. And it's, um, water distribution systems work by gravity because we pump water to places that ensure that gravity can work. So we had this very large discussion when I was doing the review, systems review of uh, Sydney's water supply system ages ago. And they said, but it's all gravity, you know, there's, there's no energy and transfer costs, it's all gravity. And so, yes, it's gravity, but you've got 700 pumps making sure you have gravity supplies. <laughs> um, and then there's a pressure reservoir, which is, you know, we, we pump water up to the top of hills to create pressure. Um, then out of that, there's supply to, um, to households, which is under that demand um, area. Um, and some of that, and there's runoff from those households to the stormwater network, which flows through to the, the urban waterway that ultimately ends up in the river. There's also waste water from those households that flow through the sewage system, which has pumps in it too, and, and wastewater treatment to the river. So you can see it's a completely interconnected system. They're not separate silos. Um, and to understand the value of being sustainable, um, you need to recognize that these systems are actually connected. So if we go back to this household um, at demand, say that it reduces its water demand. So, so demand A, little a, uh, reduces, and therefore the leakage from the distribution infrastructure reduces. That means that at beta, there's less pumping into that distribution system um, and the capacity and the performance of the pressure reservoir is, is different. And the big pump in the major trunk system um, is pumping less. And the reservoir before that um, is more sustainable, more secure because the water you save at the household level is water that's left in your dam and it Alpha is water that you haven't extracted from the river. So there's more, more water left in the river to, for um, habitat and, and natural flow regimes. If you go back to point B where the sewage discharges, obviously if you're saving water in the house, um, depending on how you're saving it, you're reducing your sewage discharges uh, and reducing leakage, leakage from that system and you go through, uh, there's change in size of pumps, change in size of infrastructure and um, 
you improve the capacity and the life of the wastewater treatment plant. Um, and then big numbers involved in that. So finally, if you're, your water saving approach is also harvesting stormwater and uh, using green infrastructure and reducing stormwater runoff, that's reducing your flows into the stormwater network, reducing the magnitude of your cross connection and your leakage, depending on what type of sewer system you've got with the sewer system, which is reducing your risk of wet weather overflows, which uh, dominate any water supply system. Um, and you're reducing the sizing or you're improving the performance of your stormwater management infrastructure and improving your health of your urban waterways. There's an interesting concept, which I'll talk about later, about um, we drown our urban waterways in stormwater runoff and it, it uh, has dramatic impacts on its biodiversity. Whereas if we're in the major river, we've got an issue with environmental flows are taking too much water out. And when we put the water back in, it's uh, possibly the wrong quality. So the whole reason for this, and it was orig orig originally written for a head of treasury uh, who didn't get what we were talking about, is the, the whole system of infrastructure we rely on and the human behaviours in the planning system, they're all completely linked. So if you change one element of that system, say water demand, by making it sustainable, you're actually changing the characteristics of the entire system. Mm -hmm. Did we get confirmation? Um, maybe someone can confirm. Does Red Deer have a combined stormwater and wastewater treatment system? Or are they separate? I see Katina saying no. So the, is there any treatment at all of the waste, the stormwater that's going back into the river? Uh, there is minor treatment in, um, as the stormwater uh, discharges into the river, but but nothing like the wastewater treatment plant. Mm -hmm. But they're not combined. Because in some cities they do, they actually no. take the stormwater and combine it in with the wastewater treatment. Okay. No, they're separated. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Oh, you were going to say something, Peter. Or did you want to finish that sentence? I, I think it's a good idea to separate it. So. Yeah. Fantastic. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. So that, we grabbed this exactly because this is what we could find. We weren't sure if this was uh, the case, but it looks like this is the storm network in, in Red Deer's scenario, right? There's some catch basins, the water from the ditches, catch basins, curbs and gutters, um, any ponds. Um, looks like there's a stormwater main, some erosion and outflow into the Red Deer River. All right, Peter, here's another fantastic diagram that I want you to walk us all through and I'll jump in here and there and, and, and add some commentary. But in, in general, we're still building on this theme of systems and understanding how, how changes impact these, um, these systems. Okay, thanks, Michelle. So this is a, a, a different view, a watershed view, if I were taking the Canadian um, terminology of the city. So the, the green pair in the middle um, is, is the city with its subcatchments. Um, it's got its drainage systems and its urban waterway. Um, and it's taking water from, and this is pretty important for most of the world, it's taking water from a water supply catchment, which is, a catchment somewhere else. Um, it's capturing the water, um, transferring it to the, the city's demands. So in that city, so if we take a, a watershed view at each property, which we call allotments, there's a hydrograph of, of uh, runoff. So this is stormwater runoff. And, um, and it looks like that red shape. So um, time on the horizontal axis, um, peak flow on the um, vertical axis. So if we get one more property down the, the drainage system, we get those two hydrographs joined together if we think of that conceptually. So there's two properties adding to the drainage system. Um, so you can see the timing is different, the hydrograph, um, 
the and area. This is, this is possibly like a rainfall event. It's raining and you've got, you're measuring flows coming off of storm water from a property. Or could this, could this be representative of even just uh, water use in the home, these hydrographs, Peter? So this is um, stormwater runoff uh, created mm -hmm. by rainfall. You could do the, exactly the same thing for sewer discharges, but we'll come back to that. So just we'll stick to stormwater runoff on this example. So you can see you've got the, the, two, the two properties come in next to each other. There's a slight difference in the timing. You can see the broadening. As you get down to the um, discharge point of the subcatchment, you can see you're now getting um, a, quite a strong hydrograph, a substantial area under it, peak flows, time. And as you get down right down the bottom at point D, um, you have a significant hydrograph. Um, and a, a lot of places, if they're going to treat or, or manage their stormwater flows, they're doing it at point at the bottom of the city catchments. So if we go back to the river, at point A above the dam, you've got the, the natural flow regime in the river, right? So um, you, you're extracting water out of the river. Um, so at point B, uh, you've, you've, you've changed the, the flow regime of the river and you've changed its impacts on habitat and everything else. But at point D, you're discharging this hydrograph into the river, which is very different to what nature expects. <clears throat> and it's got the uh, contaminants and whatnot from uh, stormwater runoff. But you're also discharging your sewage flows into the river um, from your treatment plant. So, <clears throat> so you're adding flows to the river, you know, at, at section C but you're changing the quality of the river. So you've got a very unusual, more frequent, more intense flow rate, plus an almost constant sewer discharge. You're adding to that river, which is completely different to the flow regimes that a river expects in nature. So, and you're also changing the quality of it. And as we found for Canberra, for example, doesn't matter how good your treatment plant is, the concentrations of the uh, wastewater treatment plant or treatment you might put on stormwater, the residual concentrations might be high, say of nitrogen, phosphorus, but it's the load that's very important for nature and the environment. If we can go to the next one. Just suppose um, all of these subcatchments in the city, so for example, subcatchment G, um, and we're going out to the multicolored subcatchment. There's all sorts of things you can do in there, and cities do in fact do that. They've got their, their planning schemes and they've got different demographics, different soil profiles. Uh, you can have different vegetation, parks and gardens. Um, obviously, you've got different topography and different behaviors. All of these things. Um, can be enhanced or changed by policies or solutions you put in place. And some of those solutions might be local retention and detention of stormwater flow. You could use vegetation, soil profiles, harvesting. You can even just change the order of flows where you can have a significant park, green space, after your urban area uh, within your catchment. So you're actually changing the order of flows, which actually changes the magnitude and the timing of flows, but also changing it changes its quality. Importantly, take our allotment, our property, uh, and just assuming the, we lose the argument with the engineers, which I am one, um, and you say, oh no, the peak discharge from your property doesn't change from your stormwater, from your volume, management solution, but you see that little red triangle there, that creates, that's not there anymore because say you're harvesting rainwater or you've got green infrastructure that stores water, water in, the, in, the, in the vegetation or the soil. So you create what's called a sawtooth hydrograph. So the engineers would say, the modeling engineers would say the peak flows don't change there, therefore um, there's no benefit. I would say, and the physics would say, 
that some of that volume is missing. Yeah, so, so this, basically the new hydrograph, let's, for the sake, let's say you on your building, a rainwater, 5,000 liter rainwater harvesting tank. Basically it's raining. Your new hydrograph is, there's gonna be no runoff, no runoff, no runoff until the tank starts to overflow. And then you're gonna, you're gonna follow the blue, right? So that's what the, a, a tank, and it could be a combination of a rainwater tank and some, um, some sort of features in the landscape that retain water instead of sending water straight to the storm sewer. Correct, Peter? It's, you know, Absolutely. any combination of these things that just slow the water from hitting the storm sewer. Right. Yeah. yeah. So it starts to become interesting when, you know, one property down the, the storm sewer system you see now the combining of those hydrographs with a slightly different timing of their entry because they're sawtooth hydrographs now with volume missing is quite different. So as you get to the outlet point of your subcatchment, you see now you have the blue hydrograph um, rather than the red one. So it's volume, it's different, it's timing is different and it's peak flows are dramatically different, especially when you get down to point D. Now, so actually, I, I just gotta I gotta confirm this up here, at the property scale, arguably the peak flows don't change, but those cumulative impacts of one property, then another property, and another property, and the impact of time and moving through the watershed, is that it's it's not intuitive. That's the issue, right? The issue is that I don't think people really recognize how substantial the the cumulative impact is in these kinds of systems when you know that the and, and and to bring it back to this of why should red deer care and why do these small things actually make a huge impact is is this concept that's not that intuitive to understand would you agree yeah, it's not intuitive but it's first principle physics so um peak discharges which is, is only a metric. It's actually not a real physics entity, but it's and it's it's an indicator and a really good indicator. But it's a function of volume and time. So if you change both volume and time, you change the peak discharges, and that's what's going on here. Just to use a bit of physics and engineering for a moment. But why this is so important is if this is really going on, and it is, we've we've measured it many places now, and this diagram is in our national policy guidance, um, guiding our professionals, is that you're changing the impacts on the, the purple line within the urban area there is your urban waterway. So some really good researchers in our country have shown that um, we're drowning our urban waterways by our stormwater runoff, and it's actually creating dramatic effects. So um, by doing this, we're actually restoring the natural regime of flows more towards what the environment expects. So uh, down at the bottom at point D, that blue hydrograph is far closer to um, what the environment expects. So it expects longer flow durations, less frequent flows um, and less intense flows. Um, that actually has profound impacts on restoring the health and sustainability and the amenity of your your waterways. Um, wouldn't you wouldn't you say, Peter, that there's a huge uh, prevalence or prevalence or you know engineers and cities tend to look for solutions. They know they have a problem, but they tend to look for solutions at D, centralized, large scale, large capital solutions versus encouraging small scale um, solutions at the building, right? Absolutely, Michelle. And I'm in yet another uh, ministerial court case over this in Australia where um, a city not dissimilar to Red Deer has got this solution imposed on them by our state government of you will build massive infrastructure to make sure your solution to D works for your watershed management. And that means 
very severe changes of the, the beautiful waterways. Um, but they just said, to make D work, we need to actually change your, your beautiful waterway running through the city into a drain and, and dig it deeper and so on, because this is a cumulative risk tree as well. And what you're doing is transferring all the risk to D. So, and I was interviewed on a national TV last week about our flooding and this concept of transferring all of the risk to point D means you're not protecting anywhere above D for water quality and risk if it's stormwater management. And there is this sleight of hand happened in our national policy of uh, we've built some substantial infrastructure at D, therefore uh, the risks above D are all catered for, but they're not, they're only catered for below D, if that makes sense to you. Yeah, and, and and then there's risks which you can talk about. What about costs? Because there's there there is there is um there is an intuition that the reason I think the solutions are proposed at this one centralized site is often because it's perceived to be cheaper. It's perceived to be more economic. What is yes, your what is your research shown there? Um, and the reality of this court case. Sorry, I'm a bit long winded, Michelle. Mm -hmm is it's a quarter of a billion versus a billion. Um, the decentralized solution would be quarter of a billion. Um, the centralized solution, which they've been arguing about for five years, is a billion plus. Um, and a small regional council just can't afford to pay for that. So, um, but it's the maintenance cost as well, because if, if water at large flow rates uh, high intensity and high frequency is running through all your storm sewers and, and down your waterway, it actually generates um, a very different maintenance regime. Um, and what if, if you're totally relying on that solution, therefore your waterway then becomes your flood solution? And what if you get an event in your catchment just a little bit bigger than what you planned for, which is always going to happen? So. Um, if, if everything is at D and everything else is just making sure the water gets to D, what you have, and we've had lots of examples of this, which is coming out in this court case, um, national court case I'm currently in, in the catchment, higher up in the catchment, you get flooding. You get mm -hmm. urban flooding. So, and you get blue-green algae outbreaks and because all your management is at D, right? So, um, so the management costs, the maintenance costs over a, say a 30 year period are far higher for the solution at D. But the paradox is when we put a solution in at D, when we're planning it, we're only counting the maintenance cost of D, not the maintenance cost of everything getting to D mm -hmm. because of the solution we've chosen. So the answer will be different in every city. Uh, but the concept is pretty similar. Mm -hmm. And what about, I mean, and you're just talking about actual costs that you can measure and you can attribute dollars and cents. Never mind the um, non-tangible benefits, right? You may want to you know, uh, speak um, to those a little bit in terms of what your research has so, uncovered. And you know. Yeah, apologies, Michelle. I'm an mm -hmm. economist, so. There's this big area they call the economists called non-market benefits. So, uh, but they do have enormous value to society and cities, um, amenity, um, lifestyle, enjoyment of the environment, um, security, confidence, um, all, all sorts of issues, not, not, notwithstanding the ecological benefits and habitat benefits mm -hmm. that uh, traditional economics doesn't put a dollar on that in the non-market area of economics that is highly valuable to people and in terms of habitat and biodiversity I don't think we can put a dollar value on it anyway it's, yeah it's, you couldn't it's but it's interesting to me that you know when in this court case you're involved with you're saying that the the, the small scale solutions at the local level is a quarter of the price or like the actual tangible cost never mind all of the non-marketable benefits of going with that solution 
right yeah okay yeah the, um, hit this one. Mm -hmm. and the, and there and there is i mean i i hope you guys have some questions for us about all these and we'll we'll bring it back up in terms of the red deer like applying these ideas to the red deer case but um yeah this is this is one of the big points i think we wanted to make here around how to think about the system and and one of the first things i remember peter saying to me when we first met him because uh, at the time we were living in Calgary and we had rainwater, um, you know, we had roof harvested rainwater on our, on our home. We had probably uh, 6,000 liters of catchment that we were catching to, to irrigate our gardens with. And we had uh, no storm water coming off our property. Every single downspout from our property was being redirected into gardens and it would rain and you wouldn't see any. In fact, and then we had our neighbor's house redirected into our garden. And Peter, Peter said to me, Michelle, what you are doing has real impact and i didn't really know what he what you meant you know i kind of thought oh yeah you know we're, we're we're inspiring people to do the same but he said no 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 you what you are doing really has a positive positive impact and and you were referring to this you know these charts and these thinking and how that property scale solutions are are, are paramount in the in the sustainable urban catchment um let's talk a little bit about how i mean we've you know let, let's big macro let's bring it down to um specifically what i would call like roof harvested rainwater or active harvesting of rainwater and uh anatomy of a rainwater harvesting system or another way the rainwater harvesting treatment train and um Let's give you guys an idea of what we're actually talking about. One one of the solutions, a really important one that we both really like, that could be employed or deployed on a mass scale in cities and in communities, is the idea of just putting tanks and harvesting rainwater from these hard surfaces, uh, above ground hard surfaces, our roofs. So, Peter, if you were a drop of water, and this is actually my this is my old house in Calgary remodeling. It's the same color. <laughs> So if you, Peter, were a drop of water, you fell from the sky and you landed on my roof, walk me through how you would travel through this, this um, sample system. So I'm running down your roof and yeah. it doesn't all happen at once. So um, eventually entering your gut, gutter, uh, which is almost like a storage device and making my way through to your downpipe. And if it's not winter, I'm, passing through the uh, leaf diverter and the leaf diverter is actually taking energy out of the flows, which drops sediment out, but it's also the, uh, its primary purpose with the horizontal screen is taking any leaves and debris that might be caught up with this drop of water. And, and then I'm entering the, the rainwater storage through a mesh screen, so nothing else can crawl in there or um, and then I'm become, I make my way through the water surface micro layer and I become part of the, the system. So in that system, um, it's, which is a bioreactor, there's, um, if there's any particles attached to me, I might get consumed by the biofilms in the wall if I'm not, if I, if I don't get retained at the water surface micro layer and I could, those particles could settle to the bottom and become part of the sludge and the biofilm. Um, and then eventually, um, if I'm in the vicinity of the inlet to your pump, which is above the bottom of the tank to ensure the, the best quality water, I'm drawing into the pump, uh, the pump, has a 30 or 20 micron screen. It's just part of its natural construction, um, which will improve the quality of the drop if there's any particles there. But the pump itself applies energy to water, which actually, um, if there's any bacteria there, and it, uh, bacteria does not like changes in pressure. Um, and then I'm passing into the house, um, depending on which tap you turn on, um hey peter i'm um, going to stop you i'm going to stop you there what's we're passing into the house but what is this just to explain it to uh folks oh, they've probably never oh, seen this haha -ha. passing through um because there's water in the storage 
um, and therefore the pump is activated because of rainwater supply. Um, the bypass device is open and it allows the rainwater to supply the house. If there was low water levels in the rainwater storage, that bypass device would be closed um, and it's a dual check valve as well. So, and it would only allow mains water to supply the house because yeah. it's no so other So this water isn't shown, but this would be coming from the municipal water supply or from the utility water supply. So this, this is a dual system that we've got shown in this diagram, similar to what you have on your home in, right? This is yes, I do in Carrington, uh, I have a dual system. Uh, yeah. Now, um, the demand in the house that turning on a tap uh, creates uh, that supply um, through the, first of all, say if I'm using hot water, uh, the drop enters the hot water storage um, or the instantaneous device. And it's, if there's any, um, bacteria in that water, it's actually uh, dramatically reduced by um, domestic temperatures, which is a, a big research discovery our team made years ago. Um, and Anthony Spinks did his PhD on it with me. Um, and that quality is going into your tap there, which is high quality water. So um, if it's cold water straight to the drinking water tap, which is exactly my house. I have an under sink filter, which is um, 0.2 micron and activated carbon, which is just on my drinking water and cooking tap. Um, or I'm supplying flushing the toilet. So it's just the fresh water in and flushing the toilet there um, and so on. So that's probably the journey of the drop through the house. Um, so a lot, a lot happens to this little drop before it gets to the tap, right? That's kind of one of the, one of the points we want to make in this system. Yeah, it's a treatment train. It is, and there's all these, as Peter said, there's all these interventions, there's all these barriers. Um, but I want to move yeah. in. I want to move into our fun little game. But if there's anything else you want to say here? Um, yeah. The most powerful part of the interventions is the natural treatment train. Um, created by the configuration of the rainwater system. So um, we can't compare a rainwater harvesting system to the design of a wastewater treatment plant, for example, that's a different animal. So that's probably my last thing. Yeah. Okay. So if you guys wanna play, if you wanna play, it should be easy for those of you who are joining us online. Um, Mitch, if you could throw the link in the chat so they can click, we've got a little quiz that we want to go through with you. It's on the website, vergepermaculture.ca. And those of you who are in at the, at the pub, you could also bring out your phone. It's not a terribly difficult URL to put in. It's the website, vergepermaculture.ca forward slash. It's um, E-R-W-H, which stands for Essential Rain Water Harvesting, E-R-W-H. And um, yeah, we want, you guys, we want you guys to try and answer a few questions. We'll go over them with you. And I can see that I can see the responses. And if nobody plays, this is going to be not near as much fun. So a few of you at least need to need to participate. The, uh, so I'll give you one more one more second to pull that website up. Maybe if I could get some thumbs ups from from folks. Okay, we've got at least Katina has got it. Perfect. Hopefully you're not the only one. Mit Renee, you're going to do it too, right? Yeah, I'm just logging in right now. Super. We've okay, got lots so of background we'll... noise here, so I'm just putting us on mute right now. Okay, sounds good. Okay, so the first question, guys, of the survey. Oh, I think you might actually have to go through all the questions before. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna stop my screen. I'm gonna switch screen shares here. Stop this share. Let's do it together. Share this one. Okay, you guys can see the new, this is what this page looks like. If you're on a phone, it might help to, to put the phone sideways. I think it'll show a little bit better. So the first question we want you guys to answer is this, negative health impacts from drinking water are very, from drinking rainwater are very rare 
and the annual probability of a health impact from rainwater supply is less than the risk imposed by utility water supplies. True or false? That's the first one. The second one, when a building is set up with dual system water supply, this is really similar to what we just showed you in our previous anatomy of a rainwater system. Peter's exactly what Peter has. So both utility water and rainwater supply. There is a significant risk of cross-contamination. So that basically means the backflow of rainwater into your utility water system. And there is a resulting um, risk of negative health outcomes. So should dual systems be allowed, backflow prevention device should be mandated to protect the utility water system. True or false? The third question is, it's legal to harvest rainwater and, and install a system that directs water for use in your home. True or false? And the fourth one, there are no benefits to harvesting rainwater. I'll be really disappointed <laughs> if anybody gets this one wrong. True or false? And let me just refresh to see if some of you have answered. Six. Oh, yeah. Okay, we've got a few, seven. Does anybody want a little bit more time to get their answers in? So we can see how you guys did. And I'm looking through your faces here. Anybody need a little bit more time? Okay, let me change my screen share. Let's go to the answers. So this was the first question. Peter, negative health impacts from drinking water are very rare and the annual probability of a health impact from rainwater supply. And we should be really clear what we mean here. Do we mean like chlorinated UV treated rainwater supply or you know the rainwater supply like a system we just showed is less than the risk imposed by utility water supplies? The answer is true. And you guys, let's see, 100%. You guys, way to go! Way to go, and Peter. What do you what do you what are you going to tell us to just provide some context right. here? So the um, rainwater, how untreated, you know, in, in terms of utility uh, definition of treatment, rainwater is um, a major supply source in Australia. Um, we've no evidence of widespread health impacts or epidemics. In fact. There's now been uh, 12 at least epidemiology surveys from health scientists. Uh, the original one was with Jane Hayworth, who did two um, so-called untreated rainwater, but now we now know there's a natural treatment train there, so it's not really untreated. It just doesn't have a lot of devices on it. Um, the risk of um, four to six-year-old children um, getting highly credit, credible gastrointestinal systems, the trots, uh, was significantly less with children drinking rainwater alone. And that was compared to drinking chlorinated and filtered public mains water. So this is thousands of children. So, um, and many years later, um, a utility group um, thinking this can't be true because Jane, um, um, really challenged the industry with her first findings as a medical scientist in this. Um, that was a long time ago. Um, more recently, Rodrigo, um, and they're in the public health department at um, Monash University, and her colleagues from the water industry, the utility water industry, said, we'll try this again because we don't quite believe it. Um, and they tested treated rainwater versus untreated rainwater um, and again, they didn't, they didn't find any difference between the two. So um, more than I need to days. emphasize this because this was one of my biggest epiphanies when I met Peter is, um, you know, if you start looking at, um, let me see if I can go back up. I want to go to Peter's system. You know, if, when you first go down the rainwater rabbit hole, all, the information you will find out there will say, you must chlorinate it and you must, or you must UV treat it in order to make it safe to drink. That is, that is 
uh, 80 to 90 percent of what you will find in certain some literature um and that's what that's what you know that, that would be kind of called treated black box treated system something something here right underneath the sink and peer system looks exactly like this without uv or without chlorine um and these research projects were trying to get to um trying to understand if it was actually the case if rain drinking rainwater was risky so mm -hmm. and so and that's the big question of um the health scientists is so many people are drinking rainwater from untreated systems because in the utility industry it's you know it's got to be a you know a plant a box or something it's got to be treating stuff in, in a traditional way or else it's not treated but that thinking fails to understand the, the natural treatment trade. So the, the big question that went on um, and really shaped my research starting many years ago um, is that well, why isn't everyone sick? And when I worked with all the public health unit people around Australia, they said, well, yeah, everyone claims people would be sick because the water is apparently not good, but no one's sick. Um, so there's there's something wrong with utility water quality standards being applied to rainwater harvesting. One of them, and we don't have enough time for this, Michelle, but one of them is E. coli. E. coli is an environmental bacteria that just happens sometimes to be in human stomachs as part of the human microflora. It's actually not a pathogen. So um, there's a yeah. mutation of E. coli, E. coli A157, which comes from cows, which is quite rare. So the water quality indicators in bacteria in the bacterial realm um, are all based on environmental bacteria. They're, they're secondary indicators, um, and a lot of people don't realise that. So, so when you start implying a a testing regime that's based on environmental bacteria to an environmental system, mm -hmm. you're going to get a lot of tests that say, "Oh, there's something wrong." So, you know. Um, we like to say keep the cows and sheep off your roof and yeah. uh <laughs> and your we water do, will be clean <laughs> and the humans and the humans don't let anybody defecate on your roof yeah okay let's do the next one see how well you guys did true or false so this came to that dual system supply and if you've got and we, we have very few dual system supplies in north america it's definitely not as a common because we just don't have a culture around rainwater harvesting but this is a really this is a really interesting debate that is happening a lot between rainwater harvesters and regulators right and it's this idea of do you need backflow prevention and not just any kind of backflow prevention a very specific type of backflow prevention valve right peter what is the um true or false to this oops where's my there it is false why is this false? So I've got some good news on this because I wrote a position paper on this by, our, by from our government and I found out, I uh, was taking some of their advice from the US EPA and I reviewed the US EPA evidence and the evidence in our country. So all sorts of claims of uh, uh, massive problems with backflow from resident, re residential properties with rainwater harvesting. Guess how many there are? Not How even many? one. No. None. And when you go back through the US EPA evidence, they're actually talking about utility supply and the fire truck um, needed water pressure to fight a fire. And you know how fire trucks work. They've got fire retardant chemicals in their water tank. Um, so the fire trucks hooked up to the water mains to fight a fire in a, in a large building. Um, and the pump somehow is going the wrong way. So they're pumping their fire retardant chemicals into the distribution main that ends up in the building. Um, and that was misclassified as being a problem created by households. No, it wasn't. And the other classic one um, that I saw in the US EPA data was um, pest controllers. So they turn up to a building and they need some. Uh, pressure to uh, 
um, spray their chemicals, so they hook up to the distribution system, again, the water utilities distribution system, and there's been, um, the water went the wrong way with chemicals in it and made a lot of people sick and ill. And again, that was misclassified as a residential problem. So no, it was a problem with the distribution system to the residential problem. So, and the, uh, the, the third biggest case was connecting utility wastewater uh, distribution or utility recycled waters distribution systems to um, property scale, subdivision scale, estate scale, water distribution system. So uh, a plumbing mistake, cross connection. So working through all that uh, in our country with all our data and in the US with all of their data with the US EPA, in spite of what they've written, there are no cases. And well, when, never mind, Peter, just the physical constraints of the pressure of the utility main line and the household pressure of this little pump pumping water out of your rainwater tank. I mean, we, we, we could actually just, I mean, I don't, for the sake of time, I don't know if we should, but we could walk people through the physical principles that make this virtually impossible, right? It's um, probably worth doing, Michelle. Um, how, we, how are we doing for time, Renee? I want to check. Because we're we're at an hour and a bit, we've been chatting already. So ten after three. Ten after three. I know. Should we say, should we hold this if they've got lots of questions? We'll we'll dive into the physical principles of what makes this such a minuscule, if not near impossible, risk. The risk to, is yeah. one one times ten to the minus twenty one. Yeah, Peter actually knows what the risk is. <laughs> so, um, and he's published a paper on it. <laughs> yeah, a few. Um, so it's physically, almost physically impossible with that system drawn there. And the data from the agencies who say there might be a problem show there's never been a problem. So you're coming two ways. Um, so I, I don't know what the issue is. I do know what the issue is, but it's politics. So. Okay. And there were a few people who thought that was true. Well, we forgive you. That I mean, you know, I get it. I, if you read the plumbing code, it's true. Uh, but we're talking about science, not necessarily codes. Let me just be really clear there, Peter. And you know, we're talking about the science of rainwater harvesting, right? So um, on that last issue, I had a mm -hmm. call from a national politician yesterday. The mm -hmm. position paper I wrote unpacking that myth too is now going to be used to unpack all those false perceptions in our plumbing codes in Australia. So I just mm -hmm. got that call yesterday. Oh, cool. So we can share this, we can share some of those papers too for folks that are interested, but so yeah. that's big. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so what did folks say? True or false? It's legal to harvest rainwater and install a system that directs that water for use in your home. So we had um, 90% people said true and 1% said false. So it is true, it is legal. Um, what do I wanna to say to this effect around the legality of using rainwater in your home? Um, well, you're a lawyer, Peter, you're also a lawyer. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, I'm really sorry for that. So. Um, you know, in our course, we take people through understanding codes because everyone goes to the tables and numbers in codes, but legally you must read the preamble in any code. Um, I know there's a, a rainwater code floating around uh, in Canada, but when you read the preamble, it basically tells you if you've got better science and better idea, you shouldn't be using the tables in the in the code because the tables are based on a wastewater treatment plant, not a rainwater harvesting system. So, but most people just go to the tables and go, oh, I'm not allowed to do this. But no, legally, I mean, yeah. yeah, you, you are. Have, yeah. You have to actually read yeah. what the true intent and the true qualifiers are of any code or standard. So you've got to read the introduction because it frames how the standard legally works. Mm -hmm. so, if the standard or the the standard has been enacted by the local, by the regulator, right? Even, um, if, yeah. even, if, even if it is, the standard mm -hmm. is still enacted as a complete standard 
And if the preamble says um, our tables and uh, numbers are only advisory, which they all do, um, and if you've got better science and solutions, you must use them rather than our default tables. Mm -hmm. um, that's that's what you can do. So the standard has no status unless it's called up in a code or, or regulation or legislation. But even if, sorry, lawyer in me, even if it is called up, you still must read the standard in its entirety. You must, um, uh, there's a word in law for that, but you must be mindful of the principle and the intent of the standard rather than simply reading down the words, which lawyers do do, um, and saying, oh, this table gives this number, therefore that's the answer. That's that's not the correct way, legally correct way to use a standard. So. Mm -hmm. And there are lots of examples of um, rainwater, indoor rainwater harvesting, particularly on the west coast of Canada, like some of the islands that just don't have the groundwater. And also in the Peace region, there's lots of rainwater harvesting going on. They don't have groundwater. Yeah. So I'll say that. Okay, question number four, there are no benefits and 100% said false, you guys. Yay, we didn't even talk about all the benefits. We just tried to give you guys a little taste of why the big systems, why a municipality particularly should be really interested in encouraging home scale rainwater harvesting. In addition to encouraging all these, you know, what would be considered small or like, you know, arguably, things that you might think aren't important, why they are really important, really, really. And then, then they're gonna be cheaper when you look at the big system, they're gonna have better better outcomes, um, both for the river and for these non, -tan non uh, well, what did you call that economics word? The things that are hard to put dollar values on, never, never mind, they just connect people to place in ways that you can't, you, you can't do, right? So, Michelle, I'm, I'm thinking here, um, there's a bit of a disclaimer on that last question. What was the last one? There are no benefits. Uh, yeah, the benefits. Um, one of the other benefits we, we didn't talk about is the behaviour change benefits, which most policymakers are really trying to get out of their, their citizens in the city, you know, um, the collective change, local change for the good of the community. Um, as soon as you're doing things like rainwater harvesting and other sustainable things, you're, you're adding to that community behavior change. But the benefits are about good design of policy solutions and um, so you need good policy and you need good, good designs and um, you need good education, which I think is a good segue into this one, Michelle. Yeah, yeah. I just, if, you know, if, if we piqued your interest, I just can encourage you to get better educated and better informed because there is so much misinformation about rainwater in particular. Um, and there's so many different ways you can do that. Um, one of which is, you know, we teach courses. And we'd love to, love to share more about that. Um, and then we also have some great stuff on YouTube, Peter, that we've done. You remember um, on Verge Permaculture's YouTube channel, we've got hours of content that we've put out there for free around the myths of rainwater harvesting. And we've, we've even, um, we co-hosted a panel with Brad Lancaster. It was about a two hour panel in January talking about a lot of these things as well. So I just encourage you, those are, those are two great places you can go. Um, but just to kind of summarize, you know, we walked you through a little bit of a uh, garden path story about why this is way more than just about putting in a rainwater tank at a community garden and why, you know, why we're particularly excited about connecting with, uh, you know, City of Red Deer um, uh, the, and the opportunity for the municipality to see this as a huge opportunity. Um, we talked about cumulative effects and whole system impacts, a little bit about um, the science behind rainwater harvesting and how you could produce quality water quite simply. It's actually really quite simple. Um, and then some facts and some myths. Anything else to add to close out before we turn it on some, we probably have time to take a few questions. We've ran over, we knew we would. Sorry, Renee, you're gonna, you're gonna do the pull out the claw and 
tell us that you have something else to do. <laughs> the big yeah. book. We've got lots of yeah. questions on the on the table right now, so definitely. Uh, okay, get you're going to be the. Side. We're going to. We're going to let you moderate the questions, or then so that you can tell us when the hard cutoff is probably, or maybe you and you and Mitch. Okay, um, I have limited uh, technical capacity here, Mitch. Maybe if you want to get it rolling and then uh, just kind of take it as you kind of see people with their hands up. Yeah, sure thing. Yeah, sure. So, okay. Um, for anyone in the, oh, Angela, look at that. Straight to the bat. You're up, Angela. Hi. Um, can you just go over the biodigester um, and the science with the biofilm and the sludge on the bottom for us all. Yes, certainly. Are you waiting for me? You want to yeah. kick off, Michelle? Or... Well, I just like one of the neatest things. One of the things that um, I just keep saying this. One thing that I find particularly fascinating about rainwater tanks, and also we're going to bust another myth is you will find stuff in codes and in standards encouraging people to drain and then chlorinate their tanks once a year um, because there's concern about um, sterilizing the tanks. What is um, interesting is that Peter's research and his group have shown that the tanks actually are providing an incredible function for you. A tank, the biofilms that form on the side, and the sludge later at the bottom. And I don't want you to think there's just this like infinite sludge. You can't even hardly see the biofilm. And if you have a good screens on your tank, it's not like there's gonna be this thick gooey sludge. We call it sludge and we call it biofilm, but you know, don't let your imagination go wild on you. Um, these, these bacterial communities are hungry. They're very hungry and they eat. And they're one of your best lines of defense to, um, you know, increase your confidence that the, well, there's many, many lines of defense, but it, it is one that has a significant impact on the quality of your water, that the water just sitting in those tanks and you never, ever want to drain your tank and chlorinate it. You want to just let it do its thing. Um, so, so what we found um, at the beginning of my PhD on a, on a large housing project that in the inner city that had rainwater harvesting way back in Australia when even though most rural people had were reliant on rainwater, as soon as you went into the area that also had a utility supply in the city, they said, oh, rainwater's bad, you can't do that, it's really dangerous. But my PhD research project had a bunch of rainwater storages for um, unit developments. Um, so early on, they said, oh, well, we have to chlorinate these tanks. So, and so I said, let's do an experiment. We'll only chlorinate one of them and uh, we'll keep the other three supplying the other unit blocks not chlorinated. So what happened when we chlorinated is after that event and chlorination, right, we lost all the water and we had to start again because we did that, um, is for many months afterwards, the quality of the rainwater in the tank that was chlorinated was considerably worse than the other, the other storages. And that's, that's because we realized later, we've destroyed the, um, the biofilms and the natural ecosystem. So um, the science is this, as soon as you have a, uh, um, a, a meso column, they call it in the literature, so um, a an environmental storage of water. Um, and if your nutrient inputs are low, which they are with rainwater harvesting from roofs, um, the, uh, the bacteria in the system uh, are, are hungry. So they eat each other and they form biofilms. The, the formation of biofilms, uh, with biofilms form everywhere. They're on your desk, you just can't see them. Um, the formation of biofilms is from um, natural environmental bacteria, normally a soil bacteria like a bacillus, um, a more resilient bacteria, and they, they build layers like cities, cities on surfaces, we call them. And they, 
you usually can't see them, but you can once they build up a bit and they become very effective. So in your bioreactor of the tank storage, you've got at the surface is what's known as the water surface micro layer. It's also a skin friction layer if you're into physics. Uh, medical scientists discovered this in the early 1900s and published it in the Lancet. It just happens to apply to rainwater harvesting. That's why you don't draw water from the very surface layer. So lots of things get trapped in the surface layer but can't get into the water column because of skin friction and because there's an interface there with air. So that's uh, where uh, if anything's going to be in the water, it's going to sit in that layer. But within the storage, you've got this gentle circulation, um, the James Bond, um, gently stirred, not shaken, um, because the water's being used. And you've got uh, materials being drawn out of the water column because of the biofilms, the hungry on the surface. You've got competitive exclusion between the, which are, these are all um, pretty well published um, biological concepts in nature, our best science journal, by the way, because stronger bacteria, which is your, your less harmful and more stable environmental bacteria, the, um, eat the, the more fragile bacteria. So, um, so the more pathogenic a bacteria, the more it's been mutated, the more fragile it is. So they're quite readily taken out in the environment by the more stable environmental bacteria. Um, and then you have settlement going on, which any, most people understand, adding to the, the process at the bottom. And there's a range of other processes going on, but these are all foundation science principles. They're all happening in that rainwater storage. Um, Australia was a big science experiment because farmers who relied on rainwater harvesting throughout our big country, as big as yours, uh, weren't getting sick and they weren't buying all these products. But they worked out how to manage their rainwater storages so they got the best quality out of it. What they were doing is manipulating how they operate and work with nature around the, the bioreactors, which they didn't know they were bioreactors. They just knew if they behaved in a certain way and they treated their storage in a certain way, basically, don't touch it. It ain't broke, leave it alone, which is Australian terminology, um, and draw the water out at the right level and so on. Never put chlorine in it. They were actually getting high quality water. So when I started my PhD on this and the journey well over 20 years ago, we learned a lot from rural people who weren't getting sick who knew how to manage their storages. Now, they didn't know they were bioreactors. Science tells us that. So, sorry for the long answer. Um, log on to um, Verge Permaculture to get the even longer answer, I think. You're on mute, Michelle. I said, who's up next? Matt Gould is up next, or at least he. I, I was uh, I was up next, but I was just thinking I don't want to waste people's time because I'm wondering about um, a local solution for red deer in Alberta and in Canada because of the freeze and what happens in winter and stuff like that. So I think there are probably local sources. Renee might be helpful and all that kind of stuff. And Angela, so it's not kind of a, a big high question. It's a small question about putting it in our own house and how you retrofit it and if that's possible and all that stuff. So that's probably more local, huh? Um, well, I'll leave it to Michelle to, uh, to answer because she, she's working on this right now and um, she's, she's got good news for you. Yeah. Oh, good. Thanks. Well, you know, there's no question that uh, in our climate compared to Australian climates, they have it easy, right? Especially in the retrofit. They can, they, for indoor year round use in Australia, they just stick a tank outside their house. It is, it is much easier. We have, we have an extra consideration if you're trying to do year round use, and maybe I should back up and just say the positive benefit is still a huge positive benefit, even if it's only seasonal. So even if you just started with, and, and that's where you should start really, uh, a, a seasonal rainwater harvesting system purely to irrigate your lawn or your garden yet or yet and some you know and then start noticing the water runoff from your roof 
and make sure it's not going straight to the to the storm sewer. So, you know, redirect your downspouts so that they're at least going into mulched basins or rain gardens, or there's so many different strategies you can employ. And, and just that seasonal, um, because it snows, you know, we don't have the same kind of storm water issues in the winter time. So just by, you know, starting with the seasonal rainwater capture, you're still gonna have a huge positive impact, all those local scales. And, and then what happens, start there, you start to think, oh, you, you know, you start, you start getting really excited about harvesting rainwater and celebrating every time it rains and you start thinking, oh, okay, now I got to do this year round. Um, it is trickier and it is more expensive to retrofit for because we have to have the freeze, you know, think about how do we not freeze water in the winter time. So if you are going to do it, like what we're doing at our farm, um, probably the tank either has to be in the house, right? Like my grandmother in Northern Saskatchewan had an integrated rainwater tank in her basement. That's what, the, that's what she had, right? Um, or underground, buried underground, similar to a septic, similar to a septic tank. And in a lot of urban areas that might not be uh, really feasible. And that's okay. Still the, the seasonal solution is, is, is still gonna have a really big positive impact. Um, but yeah, there will be some homeowners who plan for it or have the ability to bury tanks or put tanks inside, but you have to think about the freezing scenario for sure. Short answer, short, long answer. Thank you. Yeah, you've got a question. Yeah, th thanks uh, Michelle and Peter for such a great, overview and primer for those of us who who don't have that expertise that you guys have so I really appreciate the the chat um, my question was um, so so my understanding uh, Peter from your research is that there's minimal risk uh, or your literature research as well as that there's minimal risk with consuming treated or untreated rainwater uh, so do you still recommend certain treatment standards when it comes to large scale commercial systems? Um, I know in the past you've talked about how there are Canadian guidelines, but like you said, there are E. coli standards, but is that really a, a realistic requirement to have as part of the guidelines? So just curious if, if there are treatment standards that you still recommend uh, for larger scale commercial systems. Thanks for your question, Katina certainly recommend a good design system, but um, keeping in mind that designing it around the understanding of how the, the science of how the rainwater harvesting system works. So we, um, we David Cunliffe was um, the chair of our EN health guidelines in Australia and uh, on rainwater harvesting. And he famously said, and I agree, um, if the water doesn't smell and it's not discolored, um, that is a really good rule of thumb of the water's okay. Because um, they put forward, there's no point, um, unless it's at a reasonable community scale of, of testing rainwater, because the, stand, the, the testing methods aren't consistent with what you're trying to test. So they're not, they're not giving you good information about the quality. But I, if you're doing a, a commercial or a community scale project, you certainly want to make sure you've got a good design around your treatment train in place. Um, and you want to do um, your risk analysis. So risk analysis isn't saying get product X and put it in. The risk analysis is saying from roof all the way through to different end uses you've got to use the rainwater for. What's the potential risk? What have you got in place to avoid it? And, um, and what's the quality you're looking for at the other end? So it's more about, so the, roof, the water falls on the roof. Um, you've got to have a drinking water end use. So obviously to be really um, slightly humorous about it, obviously if you don't have humans, cows, big higher order mammals, defecating on your roof, you take out 99.9% .9 of the, the risk profile um, for some illnesses, um, what is the roof material, um, and so on. And if 
your community use of that rainwater is only for gardens, you're saying, well, okay, with a reasonable treatment train, I'm not that worried. But if your community use is for drinking, obviously you'd be far more diligent about your design and actually working through your entire design process of, rather than just saying, at the end, I'm going to buy a black box X, Y, and Z, or as one of our students got from a salesperson, five or six things to plug on the end that cost her many thousands more than she needed to pay. Rather than just doing that black box at the end, just going right from the start of your system and, and saying, what does my design need to do to avoid rather than treat the risks? And then putting the any any treatment in that you might need. I would be saying if it's a it's a community scale, commercial scale drinking water use, you would certainly be putting um, some sort of treatment at the tap, um, such as I've got in my house here. It's a, a, a two micron filter with the carbon, um, but just work through that whole system, which you know water planners do do for utility supplies. Um, it's yeah, and, uh, I want to reiterate too, rainwater starts at low risk. Rainwater is is so clean when it falls from the sky. Like we're not talking about the source being stormwater or the source being wastewater or the source being anything else. We're talking about the input to the system being inherently very, very low risk. Um, so, yeah, and, and I just, I need to remind that because you, honestly, you read some of these standards out there on rainwater harvesting and you would think that when it rains, we should all go take cover. It's so dangerous. You would actually think that based on what the standards are saying. Like there are they're standards saying, don't put rainwater on your skin don't put it on your skin. And that's, there are standards that say that. And yet we go out in the rain. Um, I think the so, question I, I, and I, I, yeah. I collect rainwater at home, so I'm hundred yeah. percent on board, yeah. but I think the question I've, I yeah. have heard in the past is, you know, like bird droppings or heavy metals run, you know, from your ash, asphalt. So are those, are those concerns? Are they actually concerns? Or are they just misconceptions, you know, in terms of contaminating the, the water? So, Katina, um, bird droppings are a fairly significant misconception around rainwater quality, unless you have a flock of pelicans live on your roof. Um, um, so the, the bacterial, the, the major um, apparent bacterial risks from bird poo are not the same as from mammals. Even cryptosporidium from birds is not the same strain as the one from cows that make people sick. So you, when, you, when you unpack this, you, you realize that. But um, the, the bacteria that might be a concern um, in bird poo are very fragile, like Campylobacter, and they don't like UV light, they don't like drying out, um, they don't like any changes of temperature at all. Um, and provided you're not, you know, having the flock of pelicans on your roof or flock of pelicans actually sitting on the water surface in your tank, it's not really gonna be a huge problem. Um, so the bird poo one uh, and the possum poo, or what do you call it here, the, you guys, the squirrel or the raccoon poo is not, not a huge issue um, as isolated events. The asphalt roof is an interesting one. Um, that's where you'd be definitely looking for is the water gray or is it slightly discolored in that color to see if it's giving up any materials? I once said, no, you would never harvest asphalt roofs for drinking. And then I got pulled up by the water supply manager for Water Corporation in Western Australia. And she said, Peter, we've asphalted a, um, a 60 hectare catchment in the desert because it's the only way we can get the water to run off into our dam. Uh, which they treat and then they supply the houses in the mining town and I went oh okay well I um, need to be careful so um, you'd, you'd add you'd be extra careful about an asphalt roof if it was sealed and it wasn't given up 
giving up materials, wasn't decomposing, um, be okay for a number of uses. I just keep a careful eye on it, Katina. That's... Yeah, I would have no issue irrigating a garden with an asphalt roof. I, I wouldn't I wouldn't out of the box say go ahead and drink it without really understanding that you had a good system designed. Yeah. Yeah. Next oh yeah. Question. Yeah. I, I think, think that yeah. might be the questions from the Zoom chat, unless anyone quickly raises their hand. I'm gonna pass it on to Renee where he'll be fielding questions from the folks at Troubled Monk. Going once, going twice. Okay, Renee, it's all yours. Can you hear me? Great. Um, there's four of us here, including myself. So I don't see anyone waving their hand at me, but uh, the floor is open right now. Um, so I'll maybe get it started. One of the uh, things we identified in uh, pre workshop conversation was the lack of available training locally and having a few businesses and institutions with larger systems installed, rainwater harvesting systems installed, and them being defunct primarily because there's either a mechanical issue or lack of local uh, expertise to take over operation and troubleshoot and ensure the long-term sustainability and viability of those systems. So it's definitely something that we need to be aware of and to you know uh, communicate about and identify where those opportunities are to ensure that that succession is in place or the expectation of new hires is to have that as part of their ongoing education or professional development um, you know uh, opportunities so i don't know if either of you could speak to that maybe peter more specifically in terms of it being a more entrenched cultural practice where you are as opposed to being more of a one-off situation here, or perhaps a more progressive or uh, you know green building related practice. Thanks for the question, Renee. I, I'm a strong believer in education. Um, I don't think we are any better off in Australia. And I point out that I work with CMHC in Canada years ago, and. I think we worked on the first rainwater harvesting and wastewater reuse standard when I had great time there. And in fact, I think the Canadians are far better at the education thing than Australians are. It's still a battle in Australia, but um, um, there are good reasons for this. Uh, when you're trained in the university system, say if you're trained as an engineer, you don't get taught any of this stuff. You, uh, you only get taught the utility perspective and I was lucky enough to go to one of our best, probably an international leading water school um, in my university years. And um, these days they don't even train the hydrologists. The first principles is hydrology, let alone all the other stuff. So um, I was just discussing this with a friend of mine as a town planner yesterday and all of the disciplines, the professional training isn't around these types of things. So if you get a new hire, who's a university graduate in town planning, economics, engineering, uh, even in health sciences, they are not taught these things. Um, so you get a conservative response to any initiatives you might do because it's just a lack of knowledge. Um, so sorry, I'm having a whinge about that, but so yes, training is really important, but uh, a community of practice is really important. So once you get to know these systems and you're comparing notes with each other, but to recognize there's no training in professionals in this area, in their formal education, helps you understand things quite a bit more. With the, the cost of handover that you talked about, Renee, if you're not sure about what the answer is, because it's not in your, um, your, your DNA and your training because of not your fault it's just the way that the, you know it's not the professionals fault it's just the way the training systems are so you put lots of things in right so things about engineers if they're not sure they go add a fudge factor and uh, or safety factor i think we call it michelle and just add more things but if you ha add more things from a city maintenance point of view it means there's more things to break so um 
sorry, long answer, but I think training, community of practice, supporting each other, understanding that there's no background of knowledge here that it has been formalized in the past means that yes, the training initiative is very important. What do you think, Michelle? Go ahead, Michelle. Oof. I, I think we have, uh, I don't know if I should say what I'm thinking. <laughs> I, what I see, I'm going to say it anyways. What I see happening is um, we all kind of get on this um, downward spiral of liability and um, adding a bunch of stuff that the actual science doesn't support needing. Like, a, like back to, I think one of the reasons Peter and I, and I really have enjoyed working with Peter is it brings back to the science of rainwater harvesting. What, have, what does the research show? What do you actually need to deliver quality drinking water? And so what I see happening, and I'll take SAIT because, um, you know, Rob, Rob was working there at the Green Building Technologies as an example. They wanted to demonstrate green building technology, the green, green initiatives, and they put in um, a rainwater harvesting system, but it's very complicated because it had UV and I might even had UV and chlorine. And the sad thing is that that system is actually not in use. It's, it's complicated, it's complex. And so um, the last, the last thing I know about the system is it was decommissioned. Nobody was actually, they weren't actually using it. They weren't actually running it. They got a big grant to put in this very expensive fancy system and then they're not using it. Um, so that's, that's just always my fear. And that's maybe why I've, I've, you know, picked this up as a little bit of a passionate area of um, really educating and informing people with this, with, with the science of good design is because um, yeah, we, we, can, we can design good systems using, using science and feel confident that we're not creating um, health impacts or health concerns or else uh, risk to the utility system with cross flow connection, right? We can actually use rational thinking and design really good systems that, that will work, that we can maintain and that people will use without making it very complicated. That's my goal, really. We need to resist making it very complicated because there's a lot of an inertia and in, that there's people who want to make it complicated. And you make money off of making it complicated too, right? You sell more things. So I'm glad you said that, Michelle, because there's a legal principle here um, that's come out in our courts. Uh, but we share the same legal system, Canadians and Australians. So um, you're not protected from negligence by adding more stuff if you don't know what the stuff does. But it's perceived that, oh, there might be a risk. I'll just stick more things in. Um, it actually doesn't protect you from negligence if there's ever a court case because the, the QCs and the barristers will say, well, um, you put these things in. Did you know what they did? Um, um, and so on, and uh, things can go very pear-shaped. So I, I know at this risk-averse level, as you're talking about it, Michelle, as the idea is, I think there's a risk, so I'll just add more stuff. Um, it's not really alleviating the legal risk. So you're actually taken back to Michelle's good advice of what's the best design principles to use. Mm -hmm. You both um i just want to follow up with that uh, on that question with the uh anecdotes that i'm formerly the education chair for the american rainwater catchment systems association and then governor for the canadian association of rainwater management now, those are both tongue twisters and it sounds impressive but uh to be honest they're both uh non-profit organizations and you know are limited by the involvement or the volunteer uh energy that they happen to attract uh, because America's got such a larger population and economy, it's a little easier for them there to maintain um, the work that they do in terms of outreach and capacity building in the community, with the professional community and businesses and institutions. In Canada, it's uh, still emerging, I guess, as, a, as a, an ongoing organization. And uh, in that nonprofit context, 
you know, rethink red deer kind of fills the gap at the local level. So, you know, at the national being spread as thin as they are, it's very difficult to not only operate, but to actually make an impact in uh, such a broad geographic uh, reach. So what do you recommend or what do you think are the next steps for us as a community of practice here informally to keep moving the peg forward and to perhaps influence the establishment of more stable or consistent uh, education opportunities and credentials, I guess, that would you know, enable us to build that capacity so the nonprofits don't have to carry that weight so much as they, I would uh, argue, um, un unfairly do uh, going forward. Yeah. Peter, can you, can you talk to potentially a good success, success story in, of a municipality that you think have done, has done a really good job and, and the kind of the buildup, how did that happen? How did they get to that point where they've got, um, good policy and good support for these kind of initiatives? Cause sometimes those case studies are an interesting place to look to, right? Yeah. Thanks, Michelle. Thanks Renee for the question. Um, with a lady named Catherine Daniel, who's actually done a lot of research and published on what we call multi-layer governance, uh, which can be an asset to getting to a good community of practice, but it can also be a significant barrier. So if you're relying on you know, the associations like you talked about in the nonprofits, they tend to attract those that are selling things so you get committees of people who are selling stuff making a standard um, for a particular thing um, but everyone in the room is voting for the standard that they're creating around the their business interests so um, and there's obviously a few good-hearted people as well so i was part of our national rainwater harvesting association here um, to build a community of practices, success stories have been around cities and shires and around like city of Red Deer, where it always comes back to a passionate individual, unfortunately. Uh, and um, they gain a, they become a champion with, and they, for success, there's two, Two criteria you need that passionate individual at one level um, who's not just selling something and you need the um someone in the city who believes in that as well so you've got this duality going on um and the success stories everywhere if you've got that sort of relationship where uh they they build momentum around there's someone in the city that's on on board and thinks this is a very important thing to do and there's a champion as well and that they build that community of practice the next barrier you have to get through is almost every standard and every piece of advice you'll get around almost anything sustainable not just rainwater harvesting i had the same thing with my solar batteries and rainwater and uh, solar panels is this far more misinformation than true information so you're emerging partnership of those two champions, one in the city and one not, um, then have to create your own facts. Um, and that is the very important barrier, next barrier you have to get through. So what happens where everywhere, and this has happened mostly at the, the city level and the shire level in, in countries I've worked in, in the UK and Australia and even in Canada, um, so you had some good initiatives on the West Coast in Canada as well, where the second step in this process is you create your own facts because the, the risk-averse type advice of what you must do gets in the road of the reality of how to do this. Um, and on that basis, it's then education, pulling people in. Um, so I'm being general about the talk, but this is the method that's worked for uh, most areas. And these groundswells, including the basics policy in New South Wales, which has got targets for energy and water sustainability on every building in, 
in New South Wales, um, or most buildings, they were actually driven by some champions, working with champions within the cities, uh, municipalities, um, and they actually talk truth to government, if you like, which was our state governments, and saying no. Uh, and they got through the barrier of no, with, uh, with rainwater harvesting and that basic standard, the utility and others and the health departments came out against the cities and said, if you do rainwater harvesting, everyone's going to die. And you could go back in the early 2000s and in New South Wales and Australia, and you could see that debate and the local champions and the champions in the cities and then the mayors got involved, involved so this isn't true. Um, and they got through that misinformation stage, but then they realised that together with their community of practice, the city and the champions actually had to help people design and implement things that work properly and are understood. So, then the next level was community education around how the city saw this and rolling out their projects built properly, managed properly, and producing their evidence, and then inserting that into policy. So um, the city's policy said, you will do this, which we talked about right at the start with our opportunity. And they're the success stories across many cities, as I, I use New South Wales as an example across many cities um, with the basic policy, but that actually happened because there were champions um, who weren't selling stuff and there were people within the city who believed this need to be done. So that partnership between the champions and the, the city people um, created this, this chain of events um, and it's been very successful. So who in the city is putting their hand up? Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and something tangible that I think would be really neat <laughs> would be, say, for the city of Red, like a goal would be to publish your own stand, like not a standard, but publish your own guide, rainwater harvesting and red deer. Um, and there's a there's a fantastic one that Peter was involved with producing for um, who I mean, who was that for a particular municipality, Peter, or was that for it, it originated. Yeah. It originated from a request from Australia's largest developer who wanted to build a sustainable city and, and put rainwater harvesting in and green infrastructure and everything else. And the local council, which I won't name, said, no, here's our standards. You can't do any of that. And he said, well, we've got a pristine waterway running through it. We've got you know, a Ramsar, which is internationally recognised wetland at the outlet of this waterway. I, I, I want to actually make my city sustainable. We need houses for people, but we actually don't want to damage the environment. And based on the standards, uh, infrastructure standards, they wouldn't allow this developer to do it. So he said, can you produce a science-based standard around rainwater, har rainwater harvesting at least so I can convince the city? That ended up being a national alternative standard. So it was written with our Australian Rainwater Harvesting Association, but was adopted by this new sustainable city in the Queensland area of Australia. So it's now the, the national science guideline. Um, it's published by Rainwater Harvesting Australia. I'll just share it. I think, I mean, and I did put the link to this in the, um, in the notes, if anybody wants to see it but um something like this oh my gosh could would be um really interesting to be able to hand out to interested you know if you're gonna if you're gonna set some planning rules around people need to do this you also need to provide them with information on how and um it's not a terribly long guide but you know as peter says it talks about the basic elements it goes through um all the considerations to design a system some um, a few schematics and um, 
And then this one I thought was so interesting because it has about two pages of research papers <laughs> at the end of it. <laughs> References. <laughs> and I think, like I said, Peter, you did that because this is a science-based design guide, right? And, and we yeah. did that because the, it was three years to write that. So the city people would keep turning up with, no, this will happen. And the way we got this written, we said, okay, if you think that will happen, bring us your proof. So um, I ended up being the chair of developing this and there are all sorts of players. It took three years. Um, so we created very quickly or else we'd never got it done. If you think there's a problem or a benefit, we'll only accept it in debate for creating this, uh, this guideline if you can prove it. So we, and it's a very interesting way to create this because anyone can sit in a room and say there's going to be this problem or this benefit. But it's actually more useful if, if there's perceived to be a problem or a benefit, there's a proof that this is the case. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, sorry, I'm a scientist. I believe in the facts. So mm -hmm. whatever they are, but facts can change. Now, um, the use of this document um, is very interesting. So we've got the codes in Australia and they're about meeting the codes. This is about good design based on science. So there's lots of people now using the codes and this together. So in their design and the, the major sustainable city in uh, Queensland actually has this embedded in their planning code. So if there's any town planners in the audience, audience, you know, planners have practice notes. So this guide became a planning practice note for that new sustainable city. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And even, I mean, it could be substantially simpler if it became just a, a you know, seasonal garden, rainwater harvesting for outdoor use that would be a really awesome first step, right? And encouraging more people just to simply capture rainwater outdoor in the in the spring and summer when we actually have rain so um that those are my thoughts in terms of like setting some goals and some tangible next steps and how i would go about it um, so, i think yeah. dialogue it yeah. is uh we are at four o'clock now yeah so just to respect everyone's schedule today i'll uh, just kind of wrap up or discuss next steps and then any final words from you both would be great and then uh, we'll hopefully be able to schedule some sort of engagement in the near future but uh, next step for us is uh, our, our annual general meeting is tonight so if anyone is interested in attending we're at the troubled monk brewery from 6 to 8 p.m uh, after today we are marking may 21st as the first public market of the year in red deer so that's typically called the Red Deer Market, and it is a Saturday morning. We're planning to have a rain barrel sale, and we're taking pre-orders now. 55-gallon uh, rain barrels, fully plumbed, even with overflow hoses. So if you're interested in that, you can see it on our website. And we will have a truckload coming for pickup that day on the spot. But if you pre-order, your name will be on your barrel. And it's a good way to uh, the gateway jug, as they call it, into the uh, larger practice of large-scale rainwater harvesting at the residential property level. Um, after that, we have opportunities for volunteering at our Piper Creek Restoration Agriculture site at the south end of Red Deer, just past the landfill. And uh, that will be to be announced, essentially. We don't quite have any dates set yet, but definitely more than one session will be hosted this year now that we're you know, emerging from pandemic restrictions. And um, I think that covers it for our schedule. I just want to thank uh, Peter and Michelle and Mitch for uh, doing such a great presentation for us today. Thank everybody for joining us and giving up two hours of their afternoon to uh, be part of that conversation. Definitely, uh, we are recording this workshop and we'll hopefully be able to make that available to you all soon. And if you have any questions, you can either uh, hit us up on social media or send an email to info at rethinkreddeer.ca. So with that, I'll hand things back over to Michelle, Peter, and Mitch, and thank you, and wish you all a great weekend. Yeah, just thanks to you, Renee. You were, you're just a fantastic community initiator and make it happen kind of guy. So I don't know if, if people say thank you to you enough, but 
thank you for all the hard work and all the amazing projects you pull off in Red Deer. And like, it's, appreciate it. It's it's yeah. a team effort, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Renee, and thank you for everyone for listening and letting me tag along with Michelle. So it's a team effort at this end too, and with Mitch organizing both of us who are. Um, we were here on time. More. Uh, thanks, thanks, Renee. You did a great job in rallying all the troops and getting everyone together. So thanks for everyone who decided to come to come watch. It will be this recording will be available. I'll be giving that um, recording to Renee, and he can pass it along. And um, we'll be also likely putting it on YouTube as well, so the whole world can see the benefits of rainwater harvesting. So thanks so much, and um, we'll see you in the future. Bye. Bye, everyone. Bye.